The latest Afrobarometer survey shows high costs, bias, and long delays prevent Ghanaians from using the formal justice system. Ghanaians say high costs, uh, a bias in favor of the rich and powerful, and long delays are the three most important barriers that prevent citizens from using the justice system, according to this Afrobarometer survey. While most Ghanaians endorse leg the legitimacy of the courts, they also see the court officials as corrupt and untrustworthy and believe people are treated unequally under the law. The findings show that among those who had contact with the justice system during the previous year, uh, many rates the system as high on corruption and low on fairness and transparency. Ghana is a signatory to the African Charter on Human and People's Rights and the Maputo Protocol, both of which oblige the state to ensure that citizens have access to the delivery of justice. But conditions necessary to ensure efficient and equal access to justice, uh, such as affordability, proximity, comprehensibility, and the responsiveness are not in place for a number of Ghanaians. Joining me uh, for a conversation uh, is research analyst at the CDD, Mr. Gilfred Isiyama. Uh, a very good morning to you, and thanks, thanks for joining us on this conversation. Uh, Thank you very much, Mama V, and okay. thanks for having me. All right, great. Um, so reading this finding, there was also the portion of people who had not uh, even had contact with the justice system who still thought that the system was corrupt. Uh, yes, that's, that's true. Um, so in the Afrobarometer um, research or survey that we conducted, uh, we asked Ghanaians about their perception um, of corruption for various institutions and um, the the justice sector was part of it. So we asked about the police, um, the judges and magistrates, the members of parliament and civil so servants. And um, Ghanaians believe that apart from the police, um, they believe um, that the justice sector uh, comes next in terms of those who are highly corrupt. Um, it is true that they may not have had any contact with the justice system. Um, but um, based on the information that they are fed with in the media, um, following especially the exposés in the judicial sector, um, Ghanaians have begun to form a certain kind of um, perception about how they think the justice sector is. So I think that is why we are seeing those high figures over there um, about the corruption in the justice sector. Mm. Um, give us a, a, a bit of breakdown in terms of some of the questions that you put to them. Okay, so um, we, we asked Ghanaians um, a lot of questions, and then one was to um, examine the legitimacy of the court. So under the legitimacy of the court, we asked Ghanaians, um, there were two statements, so we asked them whether um, they think um, the president um, should obey the court, even, even when the president disagrees with the court. And most Ghanaians, about 77%, agreed to the statement that the president must always obey the law court, even when he disagrees. And we had a minority um, who indicated that the president um, may also ignore the court. This um, tells us that people still have um, a lot of, um, the court still with a lot of legitimacy um, in the eyes of Ghanaians, um, because um, from our history, um, the president is usually seen as the father of the nation, um, is the most powerful um, um, institution on the land. Mm -hmm. So when people still invoke that level of confidence and say that, well, um, we think the court, whatever decision they come out with, whether you disagree or not, you have to obey. Um, it tells us that the court um, is still seen as legitimate in the eyes of the NN. And again, as I earlier indicated, uh, we asked questions about corruption um, of various institutions. And apart from the police, um, Ghanaians believe that well, um, the judges and magistrates are the ones who come next in terms of corruption. Mm. We again inquired from Ghanaians um, how much um, trust they impose in some state institutions. And the court ranked below the electoral commission in about the seventh position, I think the seventh position. So we have Ghana Armed Forces coming first, the president, religious leaders, the new patriotic party, traditional leaders, electoral commission, and then comes the court before you go to the police, uh, which also gives you a signal because when it comes to perception of corruption, it was the police first, then you come to the court. And when it comes to the trust, the police just ranks below uh, 
um, immediately below the court, which also gives you an impression that um, the perception of corruption also feeds into the level of trust people mm. have. Mm. Um, again, we also ask Ghanaians why they wouldn't access the justice system. So we ask them to list the three most important reasons that will prevent them um, from using the former justice system. And they give us um, that the court is too expensive, um, the system also favors the rich and the powerful, and again, proceedings also take a long time um, before conclusions are reached. Mm. And we think these are worrisome because um, when these factors are not in place, as we have stated in our statement, it prevents a lot of people from getting access to justice. And access to justice is a fundamental human right which is guaranteed in our constitution. And Ghana is a signatory um, to so many international conventions and protocols that are supposed to enhance people's access to justice, including even the African um, 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 Union's own um, mm. um, charter. So I think um, these are very legitimate concerns um, that the judicial sector needs to take on and make sure that they are addressing the issues that Ghanaians have raised. Great. I mean, the Afro-Bahamitar report. I want us to take some time and look at the reasons. So when 54% of the respondents say that uh, the, the justice system is too expensive, uh, do we know exactly what the, is it in terms of having access to a lawyer? Thank you very much. I think um, all those things count, and even the filing fee. Um, these issues have been raised um, by other people um, that even the filing fees um, at the court are too expensive. And again, we know um, when it comes to the issue about uh, legal aid, it's very limited in the country. Um, the legal aid, the provision of legal aid is limited to few regional or urban centers in this country, which means that a lot of people do not have access to free legal aid. And then the cost of procuring a lawyer um, is also very expensive. So all these things contribute to the cost um, that people think um, they incur when mm. they are assessing justice. Again, mm. you can also talk about um, the presence of the physical constructors. When you look at the, the commission's report, the commissioner was instituted to investigate um, the creation of the new region. One key issue that they raised um, in almost all the regions that they proposed to be created was the fact that there are not many courts in the various areas, which means that when people want to go to court, they have to incur huge amounts of money to travel to the various regional centers where they can have access to high courts and other superior courts and institutions. So all those things contribute to the cost of having access to justice. And uh, significantly, because of uh, uh, you know the investigative piece that was done on the on on the courts, uh, you have officials would demand money or favor. Uh, Fifteen percent of the respondents saying that officials would demand money or favor. I wonder what that translates into. So the 15% that claim officials would demand money or favor um, may not be limited to uh, judges and magistrates. But as we have heard and we have learned, and I think um, it even came on your show, um, Corruption Watch um, on, um, on, on Joy FM, uh, where an expose that they did um, indicated that some people extort money um, from people when they are going through the justice system or the judicial processes um, in terms of filing your case, um, in terms of even when you want your case to be mentioned, and all those things. Um, these are things that we have even heard people from, from the judiciary um, claiming that these things exist, and they are trying to put measures in place to fight some of these things. Mm. So these are all issues that will also prevent Ghanaians from sending their case to the former justice system mm. and to human justice. I want us to look at uh, uh, another question that you ask, which is how much do you trust each of the following or haven't you heard enough about them to say? And that's where you bring in the new patriotic party uh, because obviously we have two of the major parties. Uh, I, I wonder, is it because people never mentioned the NDC? That's why they are not featured in this. Um, I think we, we cut down um, on the list at a point. Um, but the NDC, um, we, we actually didn't add the NDC. Uh, NDC was part of the opposition political party. Um, so where you see the opposition political party, 
um, is where you can locate the NDC together with other political parties. Okay, explain the findings there. So we, we, we ask Ghanaians to tell us how much they trust um, each of the following institutions. So um, um, most Ghanaians indicated that they trust the Ghana Armed Forces and then uh, followed by the president. And, and I think we shouldn't confuse the president with the presidency. Um, the president is the second most trusted institution. So this is, this is the president as in the person? This is the president as in the person. This is the president as in the person. So Ghana Armed Forces is the most trusted, then followed by the president. Then you come to the religious leaders. And the new patriotic party, um, most Ghanaians believe, um, is trustworthy. Then you come to traditional leaders, electoral commission, the court, followed by the police. Okay, so I'm wondering how, you, why you chose to box the op opposition political parties together. Um, I think so. Trust in the, um, um, I mean, the, the the NPP is the ruling political party, and so how much trust uh, people uh, put in the ruling party um, is is very good for us to understand. Um, uh, the future of the party and and but the opposition political party, um, even as you know, um, it's basically NDC and the other political parties um, that we have come to know are very weak, and then they they do not um, um, count much when it comes to this analysis. But it's also very important to also um, know the sense of people about um, the other uh, opposition political parties. And also significant is the fact that. 15% uh, percent of the people trust parliaments. There's also the MMDCEs. And uh, on this list, at least the one that I have, where you, you know, from your cut-off points, the Ghana Revenue Authority has 10%. Yeah, I, I think these are, these are worrying issues um, that we, we all need to address. Um, when you have majority of your population um, not trusting key institutions like parliaments, and the MMDC, I think, is worrisome. Um, so these are the perceptions of Ghanaians. Uh, we, sh we should take that into consideration. And how people perceive their leaders go in a long way um, to tell you how much confidence they have in the system and how much trust they have in the system. Um, so I think these are key pressure points um, that have to um, lead to some, some kind of public education, um, has to lead to some kind of policy change to make sure that these institutions impose much confidence in the people um, um, for the better of our democracy. Mm. Help us also understand the people uh, you know, that you interviewed in this particular survey. Give us the number, uh, a little background of who, who these people are. So the Afrobarometer um, survey in 2019, which is round eight, interviewed 2,400 adult Ghanaians uh, throughout the country. And uh, we say it's by uh, randomization. So every Ghanaian, adult Ghanaian, has the chance of being interviewed by Afrobarometer. And this number that we are saying, the 2,400, gives us 95% confidence level in the findings that we have given you. So it means that if you want to go out with this same number and use the Afrobarometer survey, in 95% out of 100, or 95% times out of 100, you will get the same response, either plus or minus two. Mm. Do we expect, particularly the the, the judiciary, uh, to take any action because of this finding? Otherwise, how far do we intend to take this, apart from letting I, people know? I, I think the that outcome. the judiciary has been very responsive um, to Afrobarometer findings over the years, and if you see the issues that have been raised here. I think some of them are being addressed by specific policies um, uh, by the, the judiciary. So if you look at the anti-corruption action plan for the judiciary sector, um, it talks about instilling integrity, promoting accountability and transparency, and the responsiveness of the judiciary sector. And when you instill integrity, it means you are going to fight corruption. When you promote transparency, you are fighting corruption. When you promote accountability, you are fighting corruption. And you are at the same time, you are also trying to encourage people to use the justice system because now they understand. And um, I think it is remarkable to see the website of the judicial service, um, which is a lot of information. It used not to be. 
Um, but due to the reforms that they have put in place, now they have a website very effective and there are a lot of information there for public to access. Mm. So these things all go um, into trying to resolve the issue about people's perception about the judiciary as well as to them not being transparent as to the, the corruption in the judicial sector. When they implement the anti-corruption action plan, we believe will contribute to, again, the court also has instituted a paperless system, which is now being piloted. And the aim of the paperless system is to ensure that cases that are sent to court are processed very fast and then um, um, justice can be served and to reduce the number of delays or that long period of time that the cases travel. So I think all these things uh, that Ghanaians have read are being um, responded to in one way or the other. And we are encouraging the judicial service to, 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 to make sure that um, they, they put in place more measures to expand the access mm. to court services in the areas that they don't have and also follow through with the implementation of some of these wonderful initiatives. I thank you for your time. Gilfred Isiama is a research analyst uh, with uh, CDD Ghana, uh, the Afrobarometer team in Ghana, led obviously by the Ghana Centre for Democratic Development. <music> Let's stay a while longer with the judicial system because two women are to spend six months each in prison for sanitation breaches. They were put before court Thursday after the KMA Love and Insure FM Sanitation Enforcement Task Force issued summons to them for operating in filthy environment. Rastu Zasari Donko, who was in court, reports a third person was fined 1,200 Ghana cities while a bench warrant has been issued for the arrest of five others. Eight women found cooking in a filthy environment were summoned before the Assim District Court, but they failed to show up on the first day, compelling the court to issue bench warrants for the arrest. Three of them were arrested and hauled to the court by the tax force Thursday. Presiding judge, Her Worship Ali Atta Saeed, convicted them on their own plea and fined them 100 penalty units, which amounts to 1,200 Ghana cities. However, Akia Frafra and Esther told the court they preferred the prison sentence because they cannot afford the fine. The judge slapped the six-month jail term on them. Enoch in cancer is the prosecutor. Uh, they admitted having caused the offense and that uh, the court convicted them uh, to a fine of 100 penalty units each. In, in default, they will go to prison for six months. Really, um, two of them were not able to pay their fines and have been dispatched to the central prisons right now. One other has been granted bill with uh, one surety to pay the amount at the end on the 12th of March, yes. Um, did they make an attempt to pay? Or why, why did the judge uh, proceed to the next level of imprisoning them? Yeah, they were not ready to pay the amount fined them. So they have to be sent to the prison. When they are ready to pay, they'll bring them back. Oh, okay. yeah. I learned the one of them, um, his, her utterance is in court, uh, did not please the judge. Yeah. When she was brought to the dock, she was laughing and wasn't serious. Her demeanor was just something that was not uh, pleasing the judge. See, so the judge said she should be warned. The, the judge warned her, but all the same, she kept laughing and all, all that sort of thing. So that the, uh, the sentence was mentioned, and she's now panicking, and she has been sent to the prisons till she paid the fines. She will not be released. Reporting for Joy News, Erastus Asari Donko, Kumasi. Impact of the lockdown on trade activity. In an interview with Joy Business, President of the Ghana Institute of Freight Forwarders, Edward Akron, confirmed several importers had their bills of lading locked in China, thereby disrupting import activity. Talking to our, our members, we realize a lot of them have clients whose bills of lading are locked up. Okay? And so nothing, the certainty is not there as to when this is going to change. So it's having a great impact, you know, on, you know, on imports.
um, I must confess. In fact, if you go even way down to um, what do you call them? this courier, courier services, I tried something online because I wanted to find out for myself. And then you'd realize that even the, you know, the courier timetables, I mean, when you, you're thinking of maybe most of these things coming by air, then you'll begin to have this because you look at it and the delivery times for very little, you know, uh, uh, items. It's going anything between 37 to 57 days. And then that is what I veered my mind to the fact that, oh, this thing has taken a real, you know, bad hit. So across board, it has had some serious impact on, on trade. So it is quite evident that the outbreak of the coronavirus in China is having long-reaching effects on various sectors of the economy and industries. And in this case, the shipping industry is filling the pinch. With bilateral trade volumes between China and Ghana hitting some 7.25 billion US dollars, Mr. Kong highlighted there will be long-term effects. He, however, noted the traders will work on exploring new markets for their goods. Because we're all read things on the high seas already coming in. So if you're looking at when this thing actually broke out or becoming maybe a serious matter, where people now cannot go out to do all the import, the traders themselves cannot travel to make orders, okay? Even if you are doing it online, it's another matter because out there also, you know, people are not, we know that the factories are closed down, you know, they can't. So that is where, therein lies the problem. But I'm saying the effect will be felt in just a little, you know, maybe a month or two where then nothing has come from that end, then we'll feel it. Like I'm saying, on the other hand, I mean, traders are traders. They would always find alternates. As to whether how it would affect pricing is another matter. Because For Joy Business, Shilata Maklu reporting. The Ghana Rubber Estate Limited, Grail's newly constructed five-ton Perra factory, will give impetus to Ghana's quest to adding value to raw materials for export. Deputy Minister for Trade and Industry in charge of industries, Robert Ahomkan Lindsay, noted at the commissioning of the first phase of Grail's 20 ton rubber product production plant in the Western region. The factory will facilitate manufacturing of tyres for the vehicular assembling plants expected to start operations in the country this year. Important for us to increase that to create wealth. And so when you see Ivorian investment here, that is also a part of it. It also adds another aspect, which is the importance of what we call regional value chains. To ensure that raw material gained in one part of a region can be used towards business in another and still count towards the continental free trade and increase businesses amongst our 54 African countries. It is a remarkable feat, and for that we must applaud the owners, the workers, the construction companies, and all that have been involved in creating this that we see here today. I'm told between November 2018, when they started, and November 2019, where they finished, they've managed to invest nearly 24 million euros to prepare this for us to see today. I think that applause, uh, it turns a great applause for them. Well done. Great job. But what is important is not necessarily just the numbers. It is what it will do and the opportunity and how it links in to industrial transformation agenda of our country. First of all, I'm told that as a result of this new investment, the total capacity will go from something like 50 tons per annum to 70 tons per annum. So 50 to 70 tons per annum in terms of what they're able to actually process on site. Very positive. By 2028, that will be close to 100 tons per annum. Now why is that important? We are, we are here on a rubber estate. Now you may not automatically think how that links in, but that links in very clearly, for instance, to one of our strategic anchor industries, which is the encouragement of a value chain approach towards the assembly of vehicles. And as you're aware, three companies are opening their manufacturing plants in Ghana this year, Volkswagen, Nissan, and Toyota. Again, that I think deserves an applause. And that's business for now. There's more business at midday. My name is Imano Abuachi. Have a good morning. Thank <music> you.